a hockey fan from New York City. Uh, did his undergrad at Princeton, taking electrical engineering and computer science, uh, and uh, has been applying machine learning and computer vision techniques to hockey analytics. Uh, currently pursuing a master's of engineering in computer science at Cornell. And here we go, Campbell Weaver. Thanks, uh, and thanks again to Michael Shuckers for inviting me and uh, inviting me to do this talk. Um, just right off the bat, I kind of wanted to gauge the room. How many people here are from like the Ottawa area? Show of hands. Okay, a good amount. How many from the U.S.? Okay, all right, definitely not alone. Um, anyway, uh, uh, like Scott said, my name is Campbell Weaver. Uh, I'm from New York, and I'm going to be talking about a passion project of mine, which I nicknamed Hockey Vision. It is an open source, deep learning, and computer vision project in hockey analytics. Um, I won't talk too much more about me, but I wanted to mention that I love playing hockey. I've always loved watching hockey, a Ranger fan since birth. Um, I get to play a lot more ball hockey than ice hockey in this city, and that's my team, the Black Squirrels, the reigning champions of the lower Manhattan ball hockey circuit. It's very impressive. I'm the goalie. Anyway, why did I decide to do this project? Um, I saw it as an opportunity to combine like probably my two biggest passions, which are technology and hockey, um, which prior to thinking this up, I didn't really see any opportunity for. Um, I could not really resist once I had the idea in my mind. But the other thing is that I've followed the uh, advance of hockey analytics for the past couple of years, and what's always struck me is how daunting it seems to even begin. Because hockey is so unlike other, or at least the four other major sports in North America, in that things aren't segmented into plays, or possessions, or at-bats. So you end up with far fewer recorded events. Um, and amongst all the people in this room, and some of the snippets I've posted up there, I've found a lot of value in what people have been able to do with those sparse recorded events. But I've always wondered what the hockey analytics community at large could do if they had access to a much wider data set. So I started looking into computer vision and hockey, and right away I found companies like SportLogic, um, who obviously have a very big footprint in the hockey space, and there's a ton of other companies in the domain of sports and computer vision that are applying uh, machine learning and computer vision techniques to broadcast footage in order to extract extra data like player tracking and stuff. And what I saw, you know, in brief snippets online and in my research was some very, very impressive stuff. But unfortunately, once you start looking to actually use it, all of their data and more, interesting to, more interestingly to me, the technology behind it is proprietary because they have to turn a profit and so they have to sell it to teams individually. Um, so I thought, why not see what I could do on my own? I do not have funding, I do not have a tech team, and I do not have a PhD in computer vision at my disposal, but I thought maybe I could replicate some small successes and hopefully one day turn it into some actionable information. So I decided I'd start out with the simple objective of player mapping, and just so we're all on the same page. What I mean by this is to create a system that can ingest one hockey broadcast frame, identify where players are on it, and return, spit out an XY coordinate for each player in that frame. Um, uh, this is, uh, in, in the idea would be that those XY coordinates are in the NHL's predefined 200 by 85 foot uh, ring space. Uh, this might get kind of technical, but I'll try to keep people engaged. Um, the challenge is I split into three main components. The first would be the massive headache of gathering, labeling, and then working with an image data set that has to be large in order to train any of these machine learning models. The second would be to train an object detection network, something that could identify players in frames that put boxes around them or translate them into coordinates. And the third was sort of the most ill-defined and hardest, um, which would be to develop a homography detection system. A homography, if you don't know, is, is a uh, transformation in two dimensions that can um, warp between uh, a 2D plane as viewed from one perspective and that same 2D plane viewed from another perspective. So it's used in like panoramas to stitch together images when there's a lot of shared uh, feature points in those two images. So in my case, I'm looking at the surface of the ice as viewed from a broadcast perspective and a bird's eye view or map view of the ring um, and trying to warp between those two surfaces. Uh, right off the bat, I knew I was going to have to rely pretty heavily on cloud services. I ended up using a lot of AWS, um, S3 for data storage, and EC2 instances for model training. Um, and then I jumped right into data collection. Uh, the first task was 
getting data for the object detection network, which, mean putting, which meant putting a lot of boxes around players. I found an open source tool online called Label IMG. Um, it allowed me to draw these boxes and then put a label on it. <laughs> you can imagine that this gets really boring really fast, and you need a lot of data. Um, one of the things I did to sort of supplement this process was write a uh, Python script. Uh, by the way, all, basically all the work I did was in Python. Um, write a Python script in order to uh, allow me to label one frame and then label a frame from two to three seconds later. And this script would try to interpolate where all the boxes move for everything in between. So that was a really quick way to do the work of two frames and get like 60 frames out. And it had the plus side of players change poses relatively quickly in that kind of time frame. So you get, and, and each little box is basically uh, a piece of training data. Um, it has the downside that my data set kind of became more represent, over representative of certain scenes and under representative of the diversity of scenes, player poses, team colors, and positions that I would like. But time is money in this kind of thing. So uh, that was a huge help to me. The next data collection and labeling challenge was to come up with data for homography detection system. And what this meant was I would have a frame and I have to come up with a nine dimensional matrix um, which uh, allows me to do that transformation. And because, unlike object detection, this is not a very common challenge in the computer vision slash machine learning community, I had to go about, uh, go about this in sort of a custom way. So I built my own Python tool, which allowed me to match up pairs of points. And so what I would do is drag from, okay, here's the uh, center I space off dot on the map, and there it is in this frame. And here's another one. You have to come up with four uh, non-collinear points and then I could cycle through them and see that my two rings spaces lined up. And once I decided I was good, I would save it and it would go right into S3. So now here, there's not any easy way to automate this kind of in the object detection sense. This became a huge pain in the ass down the road because you need a lot of uh, data in order to train these networks and that collection process was a bear. Um, object detection. So this is the first real technical challenge. And I decided, well, my first step in going about this was choosing architectures, uh, what I wanted to train in order to do this object detection. For people who know anything about this or are curious, uh, the architectures I landed on were a faster RCNN and RetinaNet. Um, the RetinaNet is a more recent version, sort of, of the faster RCNN. Uh, both implementations I worked with in Keras, which is a uh, deep learning framework, which uh, uses TensorFlow as a backend. These are all uh, pretty in their specifics. But the important thing to take away from this is that these uh, are deep learning networks that have been trained in academic settings on an image net classification challenge, which means there's a massive data set out there of cats and dogs and people and ships. And academics have gone and trained these on professional GPUs for really long times. And what I can do is build on top of that by taking their pre-trained networks and doing something called transfer learning, where I'm just teaching the last couple of layers, oh, the features of a person are actually very similar to the features of a hockey player. And the features of a person plus the features of a zebra kind of look like a referee. So now you can tell between them. Um, and so in so doing, and, and just to mention, the only reason I chose to do this with two different networks was for the learning experience. Because uh, this whole thing for me has kind of been a learning experience. I wanted to see what it would look like. Um, and so what can I do here? Is this going to work? No. Uh, oh, it's working. OK, so this is an example of one of those two networks. This one's actually the RetinaNet network. Um, what it's doing is at every, at every stage, it's um, identifying features that look like players and then classifying those groups of features that it thinks are actually players. So what you might notice off the bat is three main problems, one of which I would call uh, mislabeling, when things are labeled incorrectly. Uh, the second of which would be poor regressed bounding boxes, boxes that don't really uh, mark the player well. And the third would be the flickering, right? There's, uh, the network sees players in one frame and then it misses them in the next. Uh, one solution that might actually help on all three of these problems going forward would be to introduce a cert, sort of uh, recurrence into the network. So really what it needs is like output data smoothing, right? But there's a great way to do this in deep neural networks that rely on recurrence where each frame could, uh, either the classification of each frame could depend on state learned in the previous frames. Um, a network like that would naturally smooth and lead very well into player tracking. This is an example of, uh, yes, it worked. 
an example of the other network. This is the faster RCNN. For whatever reason, I think mostly because of the data augmentation pipelines I set up, this one came out a little better. And you can also notice that in this one, uh, it's detecting things like the face-off dot and the blue line, um, which I hoped would come in handy when it came to homography detection. Um, so that brings me to hom homography detection, which turned into the biggest challenge of the whole thing. And it's sort of a challenge I'm still working on. I don't claim to have this figured out. Uh, I started off in sort of the same spot. I wanted to do this in a deep learning setting, and I grabbed uh, an Inception v3 network, which is a, a Google network uh, that um, is used for image classification. So similar to uh, the transfer learning that I did in object detection, my intuition here was that I'd be able to take a, a network that has really strong feature extraction in its early layers and hope that I could train it uh, by replacing the last layers instead of just having an output of da uh, dog, cat, fish, whatever, um, replacing it with a nine-dimensional regression output, I was hoping that it would be able to start recognizing the features of a rink and then regress towards an appropriate homography matrix. So features like the yellow dasher which surround the rink and uh, you know the blue line and face-off dots. And based on where those features are relative to each other, um, because convolutional networks like this do a really good job of uh, maintaining spatial information like that in two dimensions uh, would hopefully be able to influence this network to learn. Um, the results I got were very promising at first, but upon closer inspection I realized they were misleading. Basically I was running into a problem of overfitting. Um, the networks that I had chosen to work with, well, the training and testing data which I had split up were way too similar to be working in this kind of application space. The problem was that um, because of the great time cost of trying to label a lot of data, I had so many frames that were from similar scenes. And the network, which is fine-tuned to recognize things, like I said, at a high level, like you know, people and cats and dogs, which are the composition of features, uh, it was tuned to look for these foreground things, like players. Um, players and crowd noise and stuff and not really so much the background information, which would be the hockey rink, which is actually what I needed to focus on in order to sort of calculate the homography. So you can see moving from left to right here, here's a scene that was well represented in my uh, training set, and then on the right, not so much. Um, and that's why that misses by a wide mark. So I went back and I did a lot of technical work to try to improve this problem. The first and most obvious thing I did was to clean up my data set, to get rid of those um, testing examples that were overly similar to training examples. I hacked off layers of my network to try to make it generalized better. I added dropout and regularization. Um, and I wasn't necessarily getting anywhere. Um, obviously, the, the, diverse, the diversity in the training set was a huge problem. But also a huge problem was just that there wasn't enough data and it was so time expensive for me to try to get more. I tried color filtering because this removed some of the information that was the players in favor of information that was the lines or the nets. Um, similarly, didn't help that much. And then I turned to some more classical computer vision techniques. Like I talked about stitching together panoramas. This is generally how that works. Um, but these suffered from the same problem that they like to focus on foreground features. So hockey players get picked out here. Um, whether I'm trying to compare a, a, a hockey frame, a broadcast frame with a <coughs> rink, or a broadcast frame with a broadcast frame, um, I'm still working on that problem. So to quickly go over some of these complications I've described, in object detection, I don't have a very smooth output. I could have a deeper, longer trained network that I would expect to perform better, but uh, what I really need is some recurrence there, something that for each frame considers previous frames when making its classifications. In homography detection, I suffer from overfitting. And the biggest source of this problem is really just not having enough data, because you could never have enough data. And so getting more labeled data is a big part of what I'm trying to do now, as well as looking for solutions that could rely on less data. I wanted to show you really quickly this example, which is uh, not representative of the power of the accuracy of the homography detection matrix that I trained. This is a cherry pick example, where the features happen to line up such that the results you see look pretty good, but only because it's from one of those represented scenes. So, what you can see here is sort of what I was going for from the beginning, which is the idea that by combining the outputs of these two networks, you get dots that move around the rink representing the players. Now, because both of these need fine-tuning, because this is not a polished or finished product, it doesn't look that good.
but I think you get the idea from this that it's headed in the right direction. Um, so I've sort of been saving this and purposefully not talking about it, uh, but why bother? I figure that would be kind of the most interesting question to most of the people here in this room, because um, the rest of it is just uh, computer vision stuff. But um, why bother? Like, what would we be able to do if we had this data? Uh, why does Sport Logic get this data? Um, why, uh, you know, what, what is the benefit of having player tracking? Uh, you know, let's say we could do player identification and activity recognition too. Um, and I don't profess to be an expert in this area. I set about on this project because I knew it would be a great learning experience and I wanted to get my hands on that data and I didn't see another way to do it. Um, but I think we got one great example this morning uh, in our first presentation. Uh, having data like this it can be a better alternative to, you know, we use the NHL's um, relatively sparse event data in order to do a proxy for things, like measuring possession by doing Corsi and Fenwick, which really just means, you know, how often are there shots or measuring uh, pace of play. But the truth is that these proxies aren't always that accurate. You can have a player who has a really good shift and spends a lot of time in the offensive zone, but if they don't, if it never leads to a, a shot attempt, that's not going to be recorded in any of those metrics. Um, so why not do something like be able to track where a player spends their time when they're on the ice in which of the three zones? This seems to me like possibly a more powerful uh, proxy for measuring the player's contribution to his team's possession. Uh, you can analyze a player's tendencies when they're on the ice in the form of a heat map, where they like to spend their time, where they like to spend their time in each zone. If you know where players are at all times during a game, and obviously we know when goals are scored, we can figure out where a defenseman was when his team gets scored on, and use that to sort of classify when a, uh, when a defenseman is out of position, or what a team structure looks like when they're out of position at the time of a goal against. And furthermore, if we could do things like uh, activity recognition, uh, it takes a huge burden off of some of the efforts of manual data collection for things where we're monitoring you know, zone entries or passing plays to sort of gauge their effectiveness. If a computer can do that for you, then you have a much larger data set at your disposal and you can come up with many more powerful uh, conclusions. So as I sort of mentioned, these are some of the things I want to do going forward. I want to clean up what I've done. I want to get player mapping down to uh, to a science, I want to work on player tracking, player identification, and then down the pipeline, some of the cooler parts of computer vision will be applying activity recognition uh, or pose estimation to hockey broadcasts. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for listening. Um, I put up here the information. So all of this work is, you know, it's open source. I would love for people to contribute. Um, if anyone has any suggestions or questions, you can contact me there or check out the repository. And I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Thanks. So uh, just a specific question about that first video that you showed. It was um, there were a bunch of, it was like the first one. So there were a bunch of boxes. So if you hit play, at one point in the offensive zone, there's a yellow box that shows up for like a frame or two on the bottom right corner? Yeah. I wasn't sure what that referred to. That's supposed to be a face-off dot. And actually, it wasn't that far off. The problem is it's just not seeing it in a lot of the frames. Uh, this, this network didn't do so well for those. I think it was because of, I sort of mentioned, augmentation problems. Um, in the next slide, which, if I play this, you can see this one does a lot better. Like that, it gets it a little bit more often. It actually does really well with the blue lines. Um, and having that labeling helps to extract them pretty perfectly um, if you want. But the difference, I think, was in augmentation. So by augmenting the image on the way in, you can artificially generate a whole bunch more training data. And I was doing more of that for this than with the previous network. Yeah. Quick follow up. Do you think the glass being in the way is what results in that being maybe not uh, as accurate as, as you'd like to be? In the, like, for example, the, the dots in the bottom left corner and the bottom right corner? Oh. The glass being in the way, do you think that messes with the accuracy of it? For these dots in particular, the face-off dots in the neutral zone, there are so many fewer features around it, and features around an object can influence a network's decision in this kind of thing. I think that's a big part of why these dots are hard to work, because these are they're just circles, and it's hard to distinguish them from any other circle. Um, the glass could play a role. Um, 
especially when it occludes the object slightly. But yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. It's uh, very interesting. I just want to say uh, I'm aware that there is a very particular uh, homographic work being done because what is the object? Well, it's first of all, about money, and the big money comes from the advertisements along the board. So there is work being done about identifying which parts of the board are shown more during the game, mm -hmm. so that the arenas would charge more for these specific spots. And this is done by analyzing the videos. And so, so, so this is this is being done now. I I, I know about who is doing this thing inside SAP. So I can try to get in touch with that person. Yeah, that's a good point. That wasn't even a direction I considered was, you know, how people are using, uh, using this kind of video information for advertising. Because uh, I was thinking about it from a purely sports perspective. Yeah, but, but, but yeah. Th this is, this is my, actually, uh, and actually there is, I guess, a lot of contamination from the on uh, in ice advertisement. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And where there's money, there's a better solution. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking, same for the player stuff, the complete opposite, like being able to eliminate anything outside of that yellow line as noise for you. Yeah, I, that was actually something I did um, in uh, one of my uh, examples. For the players, it actually does pretty well once you've trained it thoroughly. It realizes that the crowd has too much noise um, for detecting the players. But I did a lot of sort of uh, messing around in a computer vision sense. Um, with the image based off of what I could recognize to just eliminate things that I thought would be unhelpful when I was trying to generate that homography. And yeah, getting rid of the crowd. The interesting thing is though, kind of the shape of the crowd is almost like, if you extract that on its own, it's, a, it's almost a good descriptor of where you are in rig space. Because like a crowd or really everything above the yellow dash or angling slightly this way uh, gives you an indication of which part of the rink you're looking at. I can't. Well, this is this is super work. I can't believe you do this just to, as a learning experience. I just think this is awesome. Thanks. Um, for with regard to like your network perspective here, if you had a new camera angle, say one that was like an overview of the entire rink, would that make it easier or more difficult or introduce new challenges? Definitely, it would definitely help. Um, two things. One is. An overhead angle, kind of like, I don't know if you've heard of, I don't, I don't even know what it's actually called, but the NFL has something called like an all 12 cam or something. And I don't know if they actually use it that way, but the idea is that, or what, all 22, yeah. yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> um, all 22 players on the field should be on the camera at all times, and it's from a bird's eye view. So that helps in two respects. One, this has the obvious, I mean, I didn't really touch on it, but if there are only four players on the screen and one rep misidentified as a player, then you're only going to know where those four players are. So an overhead cam with a wider angle view would be more helpful in that you could see all the players at once, hopefully. And also, you would be starting from a point that's closer to that bird's eye view map thing that I was looking for. So I would imagine that the training of the homography matrix in that case would be simpler because you're starting from a, a closer point. And you'd see more features. I have, have you considered uh, the distortion rectify the camera? Sorry, could you repeat? How, how, how did, did you uh, rectify the image, try to uh, remove the distortion on the camera? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Because when you can, the camera might distort, right? It might be what? Distorted. Oh, distorted? Yeah. Oh, camera distortions? Yeah. Like lens distortions? Yeah. That's a level of physics that's definitely one layer down farther than I got. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I, I did not necessarily consider lens distortion. No, I sort of as, assumed this was a, a clean 2D image. Just to put your mind at ease, they're absolutely distorted. <laughs> yeah. Because, because what happens if, if it for home graph? So um, you basic the hockey rink from computer vision as uh, a view viewpoint. So uh, basically, our arena is uh, in the plane. So uh, you really don't need so uh, you just use viewpoint. You match it, get a good uh, home graph uh, matrix. Yeah, so, uh, I we really don't do it. We didn't use uh, deep learning to find a home graph matrix. The deep learning approach to that uh, problem 
largely again driven by my learning. Like I wanted to use deep learning, I thought it would be more interesting. There are some papers out there about using deep learning, uh, deep neural networks to find homography, um, but you're right that all you need are a couple of points. Now the challenge is identifying those points. And then even once I've labeled what a face-off dot or what a blue line is, I don't know which face-off dot or which blue line that is. So I can then like look for features along there and then run something like the random sample consensus algorithm, which would try to piece that together for me. And that's one of the things I'm going to try going forward. But it's it's a slightly tougher challenge than, I mean, yes, you could just find the features and line them up, but, but how do you do that? Like, I could do it manually, but that's not the point. Thanks. Um, first of all, this is incredible and awesome, and Thank also you. I'm from New York, so go Rangers. Um, so have you considered trying to tie in, you know, obviously the NHL play-by-play -play data is a little bit sparse, but have you considered trying to tie in that data with, you know, if, even if you could pull out just the Chiron, the, the game clock from on there to sort of give you a head start on event labeling and action labeling. And these are the guys that I should have based on yes. the ice time. And this is, you know, around this time, this should be happening to give you sort of a head start on like, oh, you know, this guy's taking a shot theoretically yeah. from around here. So to sort of give you a little bit of a leg up on, on your action labeling. Definitely. Um, I, I One of the things I did do, uh, which worked fairly well, was to extract the I used the network to identify the score bug in different broadcasts, and then I used some just Amazon services for doing like image to text. So I could read the score bug, I knew for each frame what time it was, and then I did think about using um, as a cheap way to generate a ton of training data. If I knew, if, you know, I have XY coordinates for where someone takes a shot, and I have a time for that, then I should be able to just go through and find the frame with that time and look at that XY, and, or, you know, find. Whatever, but it ends up being more complicated than is useful to use that to generate training data. But it was definitely something I had in the pipeline. Now, like I was, I was looking at all that NHL API data and trying to find ways to incorporate it. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was cool, but it was it was challenging, and I had other stuff also. All right, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you.